ask the students to just give me a thumbs up when they want me to move on to the next slide. So um, I guess only the organizers are actually allowing me to see their, to see them, but uh, maybe you can give me a heads up when you want me to move on to the next slide. So <coughs> this is uh, my talk is about um, sort of joint, is about the uh, sort of series of joint works with Semyon Klepsov in which we give a different approach to constructing uh, random metrics than the ones that uh, the people in the audience are familiar with. So most of the people in the audience are people working in Louisville quantum gravity, and they've been working with one particular construction of a random metric, and they've been writing, well, I know you and averages about 50 papers a year on the subject, so I'm not exactly sure. I think Shin also, so it's a bewildering number of papers and only you really can follow what you're doing, so. In any case, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about a different approach. So my talk is about uh, random metrics. So that means to put a probability measure on a space of metrics. And the one that, uh, that, we're, that you're all studying is to take a surface, a two-dimensional real surface, and then you uh, construct a probability measure uh, on, a, on a conformal class on the surface. So there are, all, there are probability measures on moduli spaces that are uh, all Rave peterson type metrics measures. So it sort of suffices to define a measure on a conformal class of metrics. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to be talking about a conformal class of metrics with one difference in what you're doing which is not different from what Vargas and Rode, for example, are doing, which is that I'm going to fix the area of the surface. So I'm going to denote by comp sub A of M. The people coming in all the time, so I'm a little bit nervous about going on. So by comp sub A of N, I mean a conform the conformal class of metrics on a surface M, which have area A. So, uh, the way that we're going about things, we we're forced to fix the area. And uh, that's either a good or bad thing because the original Polyakov theory, for example, you have a cosmological constant and then you have an area term in the Lagrangian. So in a way, uh, the area term is uh, extremely important because it's the interaction term in quantum gravity. Without the area term, gravity has no interaction in it. So it makes sense to have the area play a fundamental role in what one's doing. In any case, we're going to fix the area. Now, uh, now <coughs> we'll see in a moment that when you fix the area, there's a different type of description of a conformal class with a fixed area when you're on a surface. Now, um, it doesn't matter what surface you take in this talk. Uh, the difference that we're going to do, so uh, one of the standard things in uh, quantum gravity is to study uh, discretizations of the metric, to look at measures on equilateral triangles and take limits. Everybody, people want a finite dimensional discretization of the infinite dimensional space of metrics. So what we're doing is, uh, according to Semyon, called a discretization in physics, but we're doing a continuum we're going to be doing continuum theory all the way through. We're going to be studying finite dimensional approximations to the infinite dimensional space of metrics. This is uh, something that has become very standard in complex geometry, Kaler geometry over the last 15, 20 years. There's a certain canonical way of making a finite dimensional approximation to the infinite dimensional space of metrics. And so I've worked on that in, in various different ways with applications to Kähler geometry. And at one point I said, let's try to approximate probability measures on the infinite dimensional space by probability measures on these geometric approximations. That's the one, and that's the, that's the key, the sort of underlying idea of everything we're going to be doing in this talk. So, the finite dimensional spaces of metrics are called Bergman metrics. They are the metrics that algebra algebraic geometers 
do not know what, let's say, what a Riemannian metric is. It does not make sense in algebraic geometry, but Bergman metrics do. So Bergman metrics are the Riemannian metrics that algebraic geometers use. They're, all, they're also called Fubini studi type metrics. I'm, by the way, I'm going slowly because every moment I say something, another face appears here. So I'm a little bit afraid of going on. So, uh, okay, so this, we're going to study this finite dimensional space of Bergman metrics. We're going to discuss Riemannian metrics on the space of Bergman metrics. We're going to look at their volume forms. And then we're going to look at measures on the space of Bergman metrics. These seem to me, depending on your attitudes, this is a very geometric theory. It's more geometry than probability by far. But <clears throat> if what you're interested in is just having a theory of random metrics, uh, I don't see a reason why there's one unique definition that serves all purposes. So we're going to be giving a framework in which you can construct lots and lots of different types of examples. And the point is that with Louisville quantum gravity, how far would you get if somebody had not already defined the Gaussian free field or the Gaussian multiplicative chaos? You're using that definition to induce a, me a measure on the infinite dimensional space. So we're doing with geometric theory, there is no a pri prior definition that we can use. So everything sort of has to be done by scratch. Okay, so we're going to discuss three different types of Riemannian metrics on this Bergman space, the geometric approximation. And then we're going to discuss lots of different probability measures you could study. So the, I should mention that in the Bergman space, you have an index K, which is ultra important. So K is what you might call the degree of the Bergman metrics. These are, these are like polynomial-like metrics, which have a degree K. So one of the basic ideas is that as K goes to infinity, the space of Bergman metrics fills out the entire infinite dimensional space in a very, very nice way. That's a crucial idea. This is a, this, this uh, space of Bergman metrics of degree K. It, the dimension grows with K. And uh, we'll, I'll explain a theorem that says that it fills out the entire space very nicely. So there's something formal, by the way, about these infinite dimensional metrics, which is that in general, the Riemannian metric you place on these infinite dimensional spaces is incomplete. And uh, unless you complete it, you can't even discuss what the support of the infinite dimensional measure is. I do not even know to the extent that uh, in Louisville quantum gravity, people have discussed what metric completion, uh, what metric completion they're talking about. Okay, so let me give you some, uh, so here's the basic idea. <coughs> we don't, in a sense, we, we, although we are going to be interested in this too, in some sense, we don't even deal with infinite dimensional me me measures. What we deal with is a sequence of finite dimensional measures, mu k, on the Bergman spaces. And then roughly, the, roughly speaking, we just define the infinite dimensional measure to be a limit of the finite, the infinite dimensional measure to be a limit of the finite dimensional measures. So it's very important for us to be able to have finite dimensional measures on these Bergman spaces where integrals have a nice asymptotics as k goes to infinity. That, that's the game that we're playing. So let me pause for a minute and see if there are any questions. Excuse me? I think somebody said something. Hello? No. Yes? Is somebody sending me a message? All right, let me go on. Vincent Vargas just lighted up his screen. So is he saying something? All right, let me go on. Now, uh, when you write down these formal integrals over here, there's a measure, which this is physics notation. There's a measure script dk sub g, 
That's supposed to be some measure on the space of B, on the space BK. And then you can put a damping factor in e to the minus SK of G. So there, there's sort of three natural metrics on the space of, of uh, conformal metrics with given area, which are called Kalabi metric, gradient Kalabi metric and Mabuchi metric. That's what DK of G could be. It could be any one of those volume forms. In addition, there are three uh, energy functionals that people study. The three energy functionals are called Obanyao, Mabuchi, and Louville. So uh, roughly speaking, the original Polyakov theory combines the Louville energy functional with the Kalabi volume form. Uh, what uh, Disler and Kawai did was they kind of replaced the Kalabi volume form by the gradient Kalabi form, Kalabi volume form, and then they wrote in an additional density there, which turns out to look very similar to the Louisville density. So they combined them. So, um, but there are all these combinations that you could study. Of course, there are infinitely many different Riemannian metrics you could put or energy functionals. In geometry, oh, the Mabuchi is far and away the most important. Obanyao is uh, easy, but not so useful. And nobody loses, uses Louisville at all, basically. So uh, there are many, many other functionals that people use in geometry, like ding is a very important one. But uh, anyway, this, we're just gonna talk about these combinations. One thing I should mention is that the approach I'm going to say is not, re is not restricted to two dimensions. You can do this on any so-called Kähler manifold, which is a, a complex manifold of any dimension, which means it has an even real dimension. So you could do this on surfaces, two-dimensional manifolds, four-dimensional manifolds, and so on. <coughs> so let's go back to a conformal class. So you're all experts on that. So we fix a background metric G zero. This is of course a bad thing to do. According to uh, Polyakov, you wanted to get a background independent definition, but we're going to fix a background G zero and then we have to show it's independent of what background we pick. So we then look at the conformal class of this background metric. We might as well pick a metric of constant curvature on a surface. And then we look at the metrics, which are pointwise conformal. They look like e to the u times g0. And we're also going to fix the area of the surface, which is something that you rarely do. And um, then uh, I just wrote down some definitions. We're interested in constructing probability measures on the conformal, on metrics in a conformal class with a fixed area. So I don't think there's too much information on this slide. So I'm just going to move on unless somebody wants me to stop there. Okay. So let's just remember, by the way, what's meant by the volume form of a Riemannian metric. I just mentioned this because I use the term a lot. If a Riemannian metric is given by this kind of positive definite symmetric tensor on a manifold, and then you take the determinant of the metric coefficients, gij, take the square root and this is the volume form. So uh, if you're given a conformal metric, then you get uh, this area form. In two dimensions, uh, the area form determines the metric if you're given a conformal class and vice versa. So you might as well just use a con uh, the area form. In fact, the theory that we use fits together a bit with what happens in LQG because we only work with area forms. Area forms are called Kähler forms. So here's the, here's the difference basically. You, when, when, when you parameterize conformal, uh, conformal metrics, you use this U and this U is sometimes called the conformal gauge or the vial gauge. It's a way of writing down the different metrics in a, uh, in a sort of a slice through the metrics to find a nice way to write down a metric. But there's another way that one, one, uh, one parameterizes metrics in complex geometry, which uses the area form. So to understand it, you have to notice that a conformal class of metrics is the same as fixing a complex structure on the surface. 
And if you're given a complex structure and an area form, then you can recover the metric from them by this formula over here. This one, the omega is usually called the KLA form. Uh, J is the complex structure and G is called the Riemannian metric. So any two of these things gives you the third, but you fixed a conformal class, so you have a J. You fixed an area form, so you have omega. And so for the rest of the talk, J is fixed. And I'm just going to look at the possible omegas. Omega is the area form. So that fits together because LQG, the way that you do it, is a theory of random area forms. All right. Now, the basic theorem is that if you have two different area forms uh, with the same area, then you can write them this way. You can write one as omega plus i dd bar of phi. And phi here is called the Kähler potential. So rather than using this so-called vial, vial gauge U, we're going to use the Kähler potential as the, as the uh, basic uh, parameterization of the metric. So this DD bar thing is just taking the mixed, mixed partial, the, the Hessian, the mixed Hessian of, the, of this uh, Kähler form, okay? So instead of using U, we use phi. Uh, phi is a real valued function. I think I have that on the next slide. Phi is a real valued function. Uh, it, we, it's understood that this omega on the left-hand side has to be a Riemannian metric. So this has to be a positive form. So phi has to be what's called, it has to be subharmonic. So um, it, ha it just has to be subharmonic relative to this background omega zero. And then uh, you have a new Riemannian metric. And so it's very easy to relate what e to the u is to phi. It's given by this transformation law. And that transformation law uh, is both nonlinear and nonlocal. So Riemannian metrics and probability measures that, are, that look nice in the phi variable, that like are local in phi, won't look local in U necessarily. So, so you get different, you get a somewhat different theory if you do it this way. And uh, you can invert this relation and find phi in terms of U. So phi is very, very natural. It's just the Green's potential of the area form. So um, I imagine that people who are studying LQG uh, have proved many theorems about the Green's potential of the random Louisville area form, right? So um, that's all we're using. We're just using the Green's potential of the area form. And the Green's function and this are relative to the background metric omega zero. Okay. Let me just pause here and ask if there are any comments or questions. No? So in the Kähler class, a Kähler class, I write it as a script K sub omega zero. That's the Kähler class of omega zero. It's a set of all metrics, <coughs> Kähler metrics, which you can obtain by taking a, the, a background metric omega zero and taking ID to bar phi. If, if you integrate omega over the surface, you get the same answer as omega zero because this term will get, has integral zero. So it's for that reason <coughs> that we're more or less forced to fix the area. Uh, on the other hand, all these metrics are, are obviously conformally equivalent to um, the, uh, omega, the omega zero metric. So uh, I gave you the transformation law. Okay, so what our goal is now is to put probability measures on this infinite dimensional space K omega zero. Now, <coughs> first of all, we're going to base it following, you know, what Polyakov's prescription was. We're going to first put a Riemannian metric on k omega zero, and we're going to use its volume form. That's the first thing. Now, of course, infinite dimensional volume forms are extremely problematic notions. So for obvious reasons that I don't think I need to explain. 
So there are, and geometers put a variety of different Riemannian metrics on this space k omega zero. So DeWitt originally introduced a diff invariant metric on all Riemannian metrics. Uh, then uh, Eben also wrote a thesis on that. Polyakov used the DeWitt metric, the DeWitt Riemannian metric. <coughs> Then uh, the geometers, Kalabi, Mabuchi, and Donaldson, all of whom are working in Kala geometry, uh, de uh, defined analogous type of Riemannian metrics on a Kaler class. It's very fundamental in, uh, in the Donaldson, Tian, Yao type program in Kala geometry. Uh, with also Kalabi, uh, Mabuchi, they're working in the same program. So, there are three natural metrics. One is the Kalabi metric. That's a, effectively the DeWitt metric. And in the infinite dimensions, this metric has constant positive curvature in the sense that the sectional curvature of this infinite dimensional metric is one for every two plane. Okay, so it's like uh, the Kalabi metric makes this infinite dimensional space K zero look like an open set in a round sphere of infinite dimensions. The second one is gradient Kalabi. <coughs> and this one has constant curvature zero. So that sort of sounds like Disler Kawat. The third one, which is the only one geometers actually ever use is the Mabuchi metric. And the Mabuchi metric is really fundamentally tied to this Kaler metric picture. But I don't think that that need happen. It's just that that is historically what's happened. The Mambucci metric makes the infinite dimensional space a symmetric space of infinite dimensions. It's a symmetric space of type GC mod G, where GC is the complexification of G. So, um, all right, so Mabuchi is sort of the fundamental Riemannian metric to a geometer, and Mabuchi's energy functional is, is the fundamental functional to a geometer, but uh, it, they've almost completely unknown outside of Kähler geometry. The Kalabi metric is kind of the fundamental one to a physicist, although he would call it DeWitt, but the uh, Kalabi metric is very rarely used, only three or four papers in geometry which use the Kalabi metric. Okay, so to define these metrics, we have to think about the tangent space. I'm going to define these Riemannian metrics. So we have to think about the tangent space at a metric to the infinite dimensional space. As I say, this is completely formal because at the moment all our metrics are smooth. And until we make a completion of the space of metrics, none of this would even remotely tie together with uh, Louisville quantum gravity, where all your area forms are fractal things. But uh, in any case, uh, so the tangent space to a metric is just the space of all symmetric bilinear forms on the tangent space. <coughs> so, <coughs> so we're gonna just do it for our class K omega zero. This is a curve of, of uh, metrics. It only, if we have a fixed background, so it only depends on this function phi t. So we take the derivative in t of this curve and we get, and we get this. We get uh, the time derivative of phi t. Physicists usually write this as a phi dot. They just write a tangent vector as a phi dot. Mathematicians write it as a delta phi. That means a tangent vector at the metric phi. So this is a this is tangent vector notation at at, uh, at omega at when whatever phi zero is at omega zero this is the tangent vector. Even though phi phi t itself is a curve of subharmonic functions, when you take the time derivative, it could be any smooth function. So the tangent space to the space of Kähler metrics in this class is just the infinity of m, formally speaking. Okay, so here are the three different metrics. 
the three different metrics, you know, if we write phi dot as a tangent vector, it's the same notation, then Calabi, what Calabi does is it takes the, you're at a, you're at a metric omega and you want to define the length squared of a tangent vector phi dot you integrate over M and you take the Laplacian with respect to the point omega. That's the metric where you're taking the tangent space. So you take Laplacian sub omega of the tangent vector phi dot, you square it and you integrate with respect to the volume form of omega. So this definition depends on, on the base point omega, the point where you're at the tangent space in three ways, uh, two ways, I guess. The uh, volume form depends on omega and the Laplacian depends on omega. <coughs> so the reason why geometers don't care for this is that it has two derivatives of, the, of phi dot in it. And generally speaking, when you deal with the Riemannian metric, you want the minimum number of derivatives. Gradient Calabi is the same, but you take the gradient with respect to omega phi dot. Mabuchi, you don't take any derivatives. So Mabuchi only depends, the Mabuchi uh, length of phi dot depends on the, um, the metric omega whose tangent space you're on only in the area form. That's why geometers like it because it has the fewest number of derivatives of phi dot. If by the way, you use the vial gauge U, then uh, it's the opposite way around. The Calabi metric has just the integral of u, u dot squared. So the Calabi, the Calabi metric has the minimum number of derivatives if you use the vial gauge. It has the maximum number of derivatives if you use the uh, Kähler gauge. <coughs> but this is the one that people use in Kähler geometry. Just different ways of parameterizing the metrics. So let me pause for a moment and see if there are any questions. Uh, so, Steve, you mentioned earlier that these, uh, or at least that the Calabi metric is not like rigorously defined. But it looks to me like this is the Riemannian metric is definitely rigorously defined. Okay. I mean, the volume form is not rigorously defined because you have to take an infinite wedge product, so that's always complicated. Okay. I see. <clears throat> when you write down the metric uh, volume form, it's the square root of the determinant of gij. So you're taking the determinant of an infinite dimensional matrix and that's always complicated. Yeah, I see. No, these are definitely well-defined and much studied. And they're metric completion. So the, probably the world's leading expert on metric completions of these things is Tomasz Darvash. He's written many papers on these metric completions. Uh, Yanni Rubinstein has studied them also. So, it's a studied subject, but so just back to Polyakov and DeWitt for a moment. What Polyakov wanted to do was that if you put a, you have, you wants to put a Riemannian metric on the space of all metrics. Now, if you have a surface and you take a conformal, conformal class, then you almost have a, uni, a unique parameterization of metrics by, by the vial gauge or the, by the Gehler gauge. But if you're dealing with all possible Riemannian metrics, it's complicated because you have to take metric tensors mod the diffeomorphism group. So you need to find a Riemannian metric, which is diff M invariant, invariant in the diffeomorphism group. And so that's what the DeWitt metric is. And I'll just briefly say it so you can see it's sort of like the Calabi metric. The DeWitt metric says that the tangent space to the space of all metrics is a met symmetric tensors at the point. Symmetric is all the is symmetric tensors. And if you're given a symmetric tensor at the point at the metric G, then the DeWitt metric, there should be a square here, takes the uh, just the, the uh, metric norm squared with respect to G of the symmetric tensor and then integrates it with respect to the volume form. So that's the DeWitt metric. It's a natural metric. If somebody asked you to write down a Riemannian metric, on, on, symmetri on, on, on the space of metric tensors, I think you think of this almost immediately. Now, when you do this with a Calabi metric, the Calabi metric is omega zero plus IDD bar phi. And uh, we can ignore that when you, take a, when you take a tangent vector, you're getting IDD bar phi dot. This is your actual 
symmetric tensor here. And so Calabi's metric becomes this. And therefore you see that you get the Laplacian of the Caleb of the phi dot coming in naturally if you use the Dewitt metric. So, you know, obviously Polyakov said we have to use a different variant Riemannian volume form. Uh, otherwise we're getting a Riemannian metric and we're getting probability measures on metric tensors, but not on isometry classes of metrics. They're not really probability measures on metrics. They're probability measures on symmetric tensors, on, on metric tensors, but metric tensors are, can be uh, isometric to each other. So you wanna divide by the action of the diffeomorphism group. That's what makes it so hideously complicated. All right, now, so I, I guess this historical interlude, I've already, I really already explained that why DeWitt put that, defined it that way. So I'm just saying that David and Disler Kawai, you know, the DeWitt metric we've just seen is the Calabi metric. Nobody could calculate anything with the Calabi metric. What they sort of did, what they, they sort of said that the Calabi metric is formally, has a density relative to the Euclidean metric, which as you know, is not defined in infinite dimensions either. And the, um, it's given by the determinal Laplacian to a power. And that's completely natural because um, the way that you go between uh, Calabi and gradient Calabi from here is that uh, this is Calabi has an extra gradient in it. So relative to gradient Calabi, you have to take an extra, an extra del and then you flip it over to, you know, you're taking del of del phi, inner product del of del phi. You flip the del over to the left-hand side and you see that, that the Laplacian is the positive operator, which uh, expresses Calabi in terms of gradient Calabi. And when you do that, if one metric is A times and is, can be represented if G of X, Y is G zero of A, X comma Y, A, X, A, Y, then uh, the volume forms are related by the square root of the determinant of A star A or the determinant of A. So that's very natural to just say that the volume forms ought to be related by the determinant of the Laplacian of G to some power. It's perfectly natural, but uh, it's not exactly rigorous. All right. <coughs> so <coughs> now I begin the part which is about our own approach. So let me pause for a moment to see if there are any questions. Okay. Shen, are you, are you okay with this so far? Okay. So now we're not going to attempt to define infinite dimensional measures from the beginning. We want to just define finite dimensional approximations to the infinite dimensional space of metrics. We're going to define probability measures on them. And we want to find sequences where you have good asymptotics. And that's in effect going to be our replacement for a definition of an infinite dimensional probability measure. You're all experts, but there really aren't very many infinite dimensional probability measures, right? Yeah, on paths, yes, plenty. But on surfaces, so you obviously have a hard game to play if you want to define infinite dimensional measures. So that's why we take finite dimensional approximations to them. So that's going to be the Bergman metric spaces. We have defined three types of, of uh, Riemannian metrics on the infinite dimensional space. And actually, they all make sense on the Bergman space, as we'll see in a moment. And then we sort of want to understand the, ex the extent to which, as a Riemannian manifold, not just as a set, the Bergman, the Bergman space equipped with this Riemannian metric converges in some nice way to the infinite dimensional space with this Riemannian metric. Okay, that's, that's what we want to do. To date, the only case that's been studied in detail is where you put Mabuchi metric on Bergman space and Mabuchi metric on the infinite dimensional space. Nobody really knows if the same types of theorems are valid for Calabi or gradient Calabi. Um, I, that I think is a doable problem. All right. 
Now, there's something that's very important about Mabuchi, which I'll explain in a moment, which is that we're not literally going, to, well, maybe, let's see if I, uh, there's one thing I should have said. Well, let me just say it and then we'll get to it when we get to it. The space of Bergman metrics is a sub manifold of the space of all metrics. That's obvious. The Bergman metrics are just special Kähler metrics. So we can just restrict the three Riemannian metrics I mentioned to the space of Bergman metrics. Then we get what's called the submanifold metric on Bergman space. In general, a submanifold metric is not like the ambient metric. Like if you take R3 and you restrict the metric to a two sphere, you get a round sphere metric. That doesn't look anything like you know, three dimensional space. So it's really quite a strange thing or quite an, a, 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 a real theorem to say that Bergman space, when you restrict Mabuchi to it, actually is very close to the original space. In some sense, it's almost like a totally geodesic submanifold of the infinite dimensional space. That's my first point. My second point is that the way the Mabuchi is so useful to people is because it's we don't really rest we don't use the submanifold metric per se. What we actually use is that the Bergman space is a is a is a is basically like positive Hermitian matrices of rank of a certain rank n k. The Bergman space has on it a metric which is a symmetric space in the sense of Cartan. It's a symmetric space. And it's not just a homogeneous space, but it is a symmetric space. It is the space of positive Hermitian matrices of rank NK. Consequently, we can put a symmetric space metric on the Bergman's, Bergman metrics. That's a very, very easy metric to understand. We know all the geodesics, we know all the curvatures, we know everything. <clears throat> What's about <laughs> What's very beautiful about that metric is that it converges to the infinite dimensional Mabuchi metric. The infinite dimensional Mabuchi metric, it's not at all obvious, is an infinite dimensional symmetric space metric. It has a covariant constant curvature tensor. This is why Mabuchi metric is used universally in the field. The finite dimensional approximation can be simplified enormously by not just restricting Mabuchi metric to BK, but actually using the symmetric space Riemannian metric. So the, the reason why Kalabis are harder than Mabuchi is we don't really have a simplification that we know of when you look at the Kalabi metric restricted to BK. We don't have- knows, uh, Can I ask a quick question just about this metric GK? Yeah. Uh, is it is, is it just a metric coming from the so I mean on a symmetric space you can have lots of lots of Riemannian metrics but is this the one just coming from say the killing form on the, the ambient league group or how should I think about this? Are, are you, you going to tell us more? Are you talking about BK? Yeah, the the metric GK on the symmetric space BK. Yeah, the Mabuchi metric is yes what you just said. It's just a Cartan killing metric. Okay. Great, thank you. That, that, that's a slight lie. That's what I was just saying. That's a slight lie. It turns out it's asymptotically the same as the Mabuchi metric restricted to uh, BK. It's not exactly the same. So th that's what I'm saying that the reason we like Mabuchi is we can, we, that the, uh, you can simplify it using the Cartan killing metric. It's asymptotically the same as the Cartan killing metric, but not the same. Okay, thank you. And unfortunately, we don't know any similar simplification of the Kalabi metrics. It is extraordinarily difficult to deal with these metrics directly. <coughs> now, let me tell you what Bergman metrics are. It's an extremely simple idea that everybody will be able to picture. Bergman metrics are metrics induced by holomorphic embeddings. We're going to take our manifold M. We're going to take a we're going to take a, uh, a map into projective space looking like this. These are called Kodaira embeddings. We're just going to map our, our manifold into projective space and with, equipped with its Fubini Studi metric. That's, this, that's the projective space analog of the Euclidean metric. It's like a round sphere metric. 
we're just going to embed our manifold in there and restrict Fubini's stoichiometric to it. That's all. So the reason that there's randomness is that there are lots of ways of embedding the manifold into projective space. Given one embedding, given one embedding, you can move it around using the group of motions of projective space, which is the general linear group, GLN, GLNK. <coughs> so if you want to picture what a Bergman metric is, well, imagine just embedding your, your surface into a projective space. And I don't know what the image looks like. It's going to, whatever it looks like, you know, you restrict Fubini Studi to it. So you get one metric. Then you start moving it around. If you move it around by the unitary group, you do not change the, iso the isometric class of the metric. You're just moving the surface rigidly around. If you use general linear group, you're also dilating it differently in every possible direction. So you're embedding your surface in, in some way, and then you start stretching it in some directions and compressing it in others. That's what the general linear group does. And all the possible ways the general linear group can distort your embedded surface, those are all the Bergman metrics. So you can picture them. What, what is probably not so probably, what's, what's difficult is that the projective space that you're embedding it into depends on, uh, a certain dimension n sub k, which I'll define in a moment, but n sub k goes to infinity. So you're embedding it in higher and higher dimensional projective spaces. That gives you a lot more ways of stretching it and compressing it and moving it around. And eventually you're going to be able to get almost essentially any, any Kähler metric on the surface as n k goes to infinity. All these different embeddings in higher dimensional projective spaces, stretching and compressing and moving them around will give you virtually every possible Kähler metric. So the Bergman space is parameterized by all these different embeddings. If you've ever read Polyakov's paper, he uses, he uses Gaussian random embeddings of his surface into Euclidean space of a fixed dimension. We're doing something slightly different. Projective space is analogous to Euclidean space, but we're not uh, fixing the dimension of the Euclidean space. Secondly, we're not making our embeddings Gaussian random. Indeed, our probability measure is just a probability measure on the embeddings. Right? What, what should be a good way of saying how probable an embedding is? So an embedding is, is called a Kadir embedding. We use a whole basis of a certain space H zero M L to the K. That is a space of holomorphic sections of the K power of a line bundle. I don't have the time to really explain what it is. So in the next slide, I'm just going to give you a, an easy way of thinking about it. But these embeddings have NK plus one components and so they're, they're, uh, we're using a whole basis for what are called the holomorphic sections of a power of a line bundle. So since that's probably an unfamiliar term to a lot of people, I noticed that uh, in the case where M is a complex projective space, then this space over here just means homogeneous polynomials of degree K. So it's like taking, a, uh, it's like just taking the monomials of degree K putting them into a map, Z, al Z alpha one, Z alpha two, Z alpha three, just make a, a vector of all the different monomials of degree K. That gives you a map into projective space. And then you start applying the general linear group to it. Then you start scrambling up all these homogeneous polynomials so that you get any possible coefficient. So you can think of these as polynomial of degree K type embeddings of the manifold into projective space. So to pause for a moment, if you think about Louisville quantum gravity, <coughs> you can definitely ask like, is this gonna give you any type of interesting approximation? It's not unlike taking Brownian motion and trying to approximate it using Bernstein polynomials and rather than using piecewise polygonal paths. As you know, you sort of lose a lot of the structure of a Brownian path by using a piece, by using a Bernstein polynomial approximation to it, you're sort of using the, you're sort of losing track of the independence of the increments if you do that. 
So I'm not claiming that this is necessarily a good way to approximate Lugol quantum gravity. Although actually you can prove that it, there has to be a measure on it, which does that. So this is what a Bergman metric looks like. You fix an orthonormal basis for that space of sections. Like you fix an orthonormal basis, you fix a background metric once and for all on your manifold. You fix an orthonormal basis for these sections, these polynomials. And then you, you then anything, any other Bergman metric looks like one over K DD bar log. And then you have a sum where here's the, here's the positive Hermitian matrix coming in. It, this is what a Bergman metric is. It corresponds to a positive Hermitian matrix. And you get P, I, J, S, J. This should be an S, I, S, J. That should be an S, I, S, J. That's what a Bergman metric looks like. I really don't like that uh, J here, but I think I'm not going to fix it right now. Okay. So how complicated is a Bergman metric? Well, that logarithm makes things rather complicated. It gets rather messy if you take two derivatives. Okay. So uh, the, otherwise, it's just a logarithm of this quadratic form. Rather simple-minded thing. It's not that complicated. So that's a Bergman metric. And what's random here is the choice of this her positive Hermitian matrix, Pij. OK? So this is a metric, right? Everybody agree it's a metric? All right? Because I'm taking DD bar log. That's giving me a symmetric tensor. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, originally, I think we were rather pleased with this because, so here, this number NK is the dimension of the space of sections. The reason we like this is, well, there are two reasons. First of all, we get a metric matrix correspondence. The Bergman metrics just correspond to positive Hermitian matrices. So anything you can do with positive Hermitian matrices, any nice probability measure you know on that can be put, on, put as a probability measure on the Bergman metrics. That's nice. Uh, the second thing is that the positive Hermitian matrices are a symmetric space. So in particular, you can put the symmetric space volume form on it. However, it's a non-positively curved symmetric space, so the volume form has infinite measure. So you need to use a damping factor for that. And here I wrote down again, that's all a Bergman metric is. It's just uh, IDD bar, like a Laplacian of a logarithm of this quadratic of, of this quadratic form. Okay, and of course it's complicated. Logarithm means that all the formulas become insanely messy. Okay. But we like it because of the simplicity of the description of these metrics. All right. Now there's something else that's important. There's something else which is very important. You see, the Bergman metrics are a submanifold of the space of all metrics. So any Riemannian metric you have on all Riemannian metrics can be restricted to the Bergman metrics. But there's another thing that's fantastic about it, which is that there's a kind of uh, submersion, there's a kind of natural map from the space of all metrics to the degree K Bergman metrics. So what you, it's, it's a, what it, what it basically means is that we take a, a general metric, we use it to, to induce an inner product on holomorphic sections. Then uh, we use that an orthonormal basis to embed into projective space. So I don't really have time to discuss this TK map, but it's like, it's the reason why everything works. This map from the infinite dimensional space to the finite dimensional space turns out to have very, very good asymptotic properties. And it's the reason why we have good asymptotic properties for everything we do. I'm a little bit short of time, so I'm gonna have to like move a little bit fast, even though it's getting more complicated now. I just want you to know, so there's a, there's a sort of like a projection map from the space of all metrics to the space of Bergman metrics. And the existence of this projection map is what gives all the good asymptotic properties to the uh, measurement and everything else. 
So here's the sort of basic structure theorem that the space of all, if you take the disjoint, the union of all the different Bergman metrics for all the different degrees of polynomials, then you get a dense set in the space of all possible smooth metrics, or for that matter, all possible uh, finite energy metrics. And that's not just, just that though, that they don't just fill it out densely. They turn out to fill it out in an extremely strong asymptotic sense that this projection map that takes you from the infinite dimensional space to BK actually reproduces your metric modulo a small error. As K goes to infinity, this map becomes the identity map. This map is in some sense like an, a, a, submer a Riemannian submersion from the infinite dimensional space to the Bergman spaces. So that this, this map as well as actually preserves all the geometric structures, the Bergman space and the infinite dimensional space, their geometry is linked by the properties of this map. So this is sort of like, if you were get interested in it, you have to just study this map really, really carefully because that's the origin of all the asymptotic properties that we're interested in. So let me just stop for just a little moment and see if there are questions. <coughs> if you want to understand the, I'll st I'm gonna state this as a problem at the end, but I'll state it as a problem for anybody who can follow the talk so far. Suppose you have Louisville quantum gravity measure on the infinite dimensional space, K. Okay. Under this map, this TK map, FSK composed a help K, you can push it forward and get yourself a probability measure on BK. As K goes back to infinity, it converges back again to Lugo quantum gravity measure. So naturally you have a finite dimensional approximation to Lugo quantum gravity measure. The difficulty is trying to calculate any properties of the push forward measure. This, this Hilp K, FSK Hilp K map is complicated. And you, that, you have in Louisville quantum graph, it all becomes very complicated. I couldn't calculate any correlation functions or anything with it, but it's got to exist. You might ask another question. If you push for a Louisville quantum gravity measure, where does it concentrate in BK? Okay, let me go on. Here are the convergence theorems. All the geometric convergence theorems to date refer to the Mabuchi metric. So first of all, the geodesics of the Bergman spaces are very simple if you equip it with symmetric space metrics. They're given by one parameter subgroups. And it's known that as K goes to infinity, if you fix the endpoints, the Bergman geodesics converge to the Mabuchi geodesics. First of all, so when I said that Bergman space fills out the whole Mabuchi space, I mean, it does so in a way that preserves all the geometry. Secondly, the curvature tensor of the Bergman space with its symmetric space metric, it converges back to the Mabuchi metric too, Mabuchi curvature too. So the Bergman space is really inaccurate geometric model for the infinite dimensional Mabuchi space. Um, another one is that the, in a Gromov Grom Hausdorff sense, the finite dimensional BKs converge to the infinite dimensional Mabuchi space. So Xingchong Chen and Song San, <laughs> Xuxiong Chen has spent a lot of time studying the, the properties of the infinite dimensional space and its curvature and, ge and geometry. Darvash, Donaldson, many people have studied that. And the Bergman spaces so far pass every test in the sense that they're very good finite dimensional models for the infinite dimensional space. They reproduce all the geometric properties of the infinite dimensional space. Okay, so we haven't proved that about Kalabi. I don't know if it's true in fact at this time, the Kalabi geodesics do they, on Bergman space, do they converge back to the Kalabi geodesics on the infinite dimensional space, the curvature tensors? 
they're so complicated to calculate with that it's hard to prove it. But I would bet, I bet that it's true. I bet that it's true because they're completely natural. They don't involve any choices. So somehow, but you know, it has to do with whether the Kalabi, whether the Bergman space as a submanifold of the Riemannian manifold really, really kind of like approximates the whole the ambient manifold. So let me explain what theorems we've actually proved about these. So what probability measures have we put on Bergman space where we were actually able to calculate all the properties of it? So one was a heat kernel measure on the space of Bergman metrics. This is really a probability measure on the space of positive Hermitian matrices. We just used the heat kernel on positive Hermitian matrices, namely Brownian motion on positive Hermitian matrices. We uh, use the identification of Bergman metrics with positive Hermitian matrices. And then uh, we get a kind of, we get the Brownian motion starting from some base point omega zero. We look at Brownian motions on the space of Bergman metrics. You can fix the time to be whatever you like. It can depend on K. And we study the endpoint of the Brownian motion and that would be our random metric. You just take a Brownian path on the space of positive Hermitian matrices, see where you end up with on time T. That's your random metric. And then we study, for example, the correlation functions of the area and other geometric quantities like that. And we get an explicit formula for the two point correlation function between the random, the random um, potentials we get, the random Bergman Kahler potentials those logarithm things, we get an explicit formula for the correlation functions of these uh, using this Brownian motion. <laughs> now, the, uh, I think that sounds like a nice model because you're sort of exploring the entire Bergman space. You would think that if it made any sense at all, in the limit, you would be exploring the entire Mabuchi space using infinite dimensional Brownian motion on the, space, on the Mabuchi space. The thing about it that's weird is that, uh, or not weird, but this is a unitary, a UNK invariant measure on positive Hermitian matrices. And therefore it's, a, it's sort of, in, it has a unitary invariance property. And as a result of that, it really only depends on the eigenvalues of the positive Hermitian matrix. It, so it turns out that uh, it satisfies the large deviations principle as K tends to infinity. And it exponentially concentrates back at the fixed omega zero where you start the Brownian paths. So we, that's a, what we review as a defect of this measure. It just collapses down to delta function at the background. We tried the same calculation with, with Vizhard. We damp out the Riemannian volume form by putting e to the minus trace of the positive Hermitian matrix. That's a probability measure, well-known Vizhard measure. But the same problem happens, and it appears that it happens for every unitary invariant choice of probability measure. They all have a large deviations principle. And I'm, I'm not doing calculations about eigenvalues. I'm doing calculations involving areas and metric properties. So it's new types of calculations, but they still satisfy large deviations principle. They collapse. And so to us, the large deviations principle is the enemy. We want to find sequences of metrics which are computable and which do not satisfy a large deviations principle. All right, so we also used another metric, another one which was purely geometric. It does not use the matrix metric correspondence at all. We put the Mabuchi volume form, well that's a symmetric space volume form, but we use the Obanyao energy. So we used a, uh, a measure that looks like that where this is the Mabuchi volume form on Bergman space. And this is the, this is the certain energy over here, which is given by, this is called Donaldson's balancing energy. So Donaldson is said, let's use this energy over here. So it involves one term, which is geometric and one term, which is in terms of the positive Hermitian matrix P. It corresponds to the Bergman metric. And this, this uh, Donaldson invented this functional because it converges to the Mabuchi functional as K goes to infinity. 
So this is a toy model, a finite dimensional model for using e to the minus constant times the Mabuchi energy functional against the Mabuchi metric, a Mabuchi volume form. So we could not calculate much with it, but we could show that we could find the, the, the smallest gamma k for which this thing converges. It's not even obvious that this is finite volume metric, finite volume measure. So we proved a few, some, several other things about it, but we cannot calculate correlation functions, for example, with this thing. But still, this is a toy model. It's a, it's a good toy model for what would happen if you use the Mabuchi volume form and the Mabuchi, the Mabuchi volume form and the Mabuchi uh, functional on the infinite dimensional space. I should mention, by the way, that Disler Kawai applies to the, the Mabuchi metric every bit as much as the Kalabi metric. It says that the Mabuchi volume form in infinite dimension should be a different power of the Laplace operator determinant times the flat volume form. So you should be able to make sense of this thing also. This would be, well, that's all much as I'll say about that. And I'll, I'll end with one slide that we don't have a good simplification of the restriction of the Kalabi volume form to the Bergman space. Nobody has ever studied it. However, uh, because the Kalabi volume form has constant positive curvature, so it looks like you're on a piece of the sphere. And because we believe that the curvature tensor of the Bergman space will tend to the curvature tensor of the limit, the, the Bergman space should have a finite Kalabi volume. It should look like a finite dimensional subsphere of the infinite dimensional sphere. So you can normalize it. You can normalize the Kalabi volume form to be a probability measure on Bergman space. And this one definitely should not have a large deviation principle. In the limit, it should tend to some renormalized version of the Kalabi volume form that Polyakov was interested in the limit. So I think that's an interesting model. It's also interesting to express the, this in terms of the gradient Kalabi and see whether or not the distal Kawai conjecture actually makes sense as an asymptotic theorem. If we take this Kalabi metric on Bergman space and express it in terms of gradient Kalabi, then we have the density that Dissler and Kawai were discussing. And we can look at the asymptotics of that and see whether or not it makes any sense as K tends to infinity. If you really wanted to check whether the Dissler Kawai conjecture is actually makes any sense, I think this is a, a promising way to do it. So let me stop there. <laughs>